Copy. Call a meeting to order. I want to welcome everybody here. Uh, Council, we've spent all day together. Uh, it's been a long day. We had study session, our summer study session. Uh, we had the pleasure of doing that at, uh, at the Mennonite Heritage Village, and we talked about what we want to see for the city. We looked at the big picture. We, uh, we uh, brainstorm about specific challenges that we see, and uh, we talk about vision. It's important to do that. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we can only accomplish so much as a, as a group. Uh, we have a set amount of time, a set parameter when it comes to our budgets, and uh, it's important for us to recognize those things as well. So with that, uh, I just figured some wise words from Oscar, Oscar Romero. Oscar Romero is, is actually, I remember one of the first films I watched, uh, uh, well, that I can remember watching, uh, back in the 80s, and it was a powerful film about uh, someone who uh, wanted to affect, affect change in his community and his country. Uh, in the end, uh, it didn't, the change happened, but uh, it wasn't, to, he, he did pay the price in the end. But uh, anyway, here is his wise, wise words, uh, paraphrased. It helps now and then to step back and take a long view. The ultimate goal is not, only beyond, is not only beyond our efforts, it is even beyond our vision. We accomplish in our lifetime only a tiny fraction of the magnif magnif magnificent enterprise that is God's work. Nothing we do is complete, which is a way of saying that the ultimate goal is al always lies beyond us. No statement says all that could be said. No prayer fully expresses our faith. No confession brings perfection. No pastoral visit brings wholeness. No program accomplishes the mission. No set of goals and objectives includes everything. This is what we are about. We plant the seeds that one day will grow. We water seeds already planted, and knowing that they will hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. We provide yeast that produces far beyond our capabilities. We cannot do everything, and there is a sense of liberation in realizing that. This, this enables us to do something, and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for grace to enter and do the rest. We may never see the end result, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are workers, not master builders. We are creators of a future, not our own. So whether we, it's in our own lives and how we treat people, uh, or if it's us as a collective group uh, in our community, uh, we have work to do. It's never complete, but let's continue on. We have the agenda in front of us. Can I have a motion to approve the agenda with one amendment, 12A? There's just a, a Mental Health uh, Act. Uh, Councillor Penner has asked to, to speak about that briefly, so uh, we'll add that in 12A. Can I have a motion, please? Councillor Penner, second by Councillor Swagstra. Any discussion? Call for the question. All those in favor? Carried. We have minutes in front of us from June 21st, regular council meeting on page one. You've all had a chance to review those. Can I have a motion, please? Councillor Penner, second by Councillor Funk. Any discussion? Call for the question. All those in favor? Carried. We have no uh, public hearing, uh, no business arising from the minutes. No public hearings. We will now move to the reports and recommendations of the city manager, 8A uh, traffic control. This is on Main Street on page 12. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council, there uh, in your packages, uh, there is a series of sketches as well as a copy of some uh, SPC committee uh, meeting minutes that were taken from 2014 with respect to uh, some additional traffic control devices that are being uh, recommended for a portion of Main Street East, starting from approximately 100 meters east of Craker Avenue uh, and continuing on uh, until uh, about uh, half midpoint of the block between Goosen Avenue and Mackenzie Avenue. Um, this file was brought before Council about a year and a half ago just in respect of uh, some additional uh, parking restrictions being recommended uh, that uh, were arising in connection with a proposed uh, speed zone amendment uh, for that section of Main Street East. Uh, at the time, uh, it uh, was the understanding uh, of Council uh, that this matter would be brought back uh, for further consideration. 
uh, once the uh, speed zone amendment had been dealt with by the Hi Highway Traffic Board. Uh, that amendment uh, was actually completed in 2015, uh, which uh, increased the speed zone from current 50 kilometers an hour from a point um, 100 meters east of Craker Avenue uh, up to uh, a point uh, generally uh, across the road from uh, Valley and Pharmaceuticals. Uh, that Highway Traffic Board uh, hearing uh, agreed with the City's request uh, that that particular section of uh, Main Street East uh, speed be increased to 60 kilometers per hour. Uh, as I said, that uh, amendment has now been approved or was approved in 2015 uh, and now um, the recommendation is to continue with uh, some additional no parking restrictions as was recommended in committee uh, for the section that is indicated in red. Um, between the hours of 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. and also between the hours of 3 p.m. and 6 p.m. Uh, Monday through Saturday. And that is the recommendation uh, based on that uh, in order for these recommendations to be uh, enacted uh, that would require a resolution of council. Thank you. Council, how would you like to proceed? Councillor Spikester. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will move the, uh, uh, the motion that's on page 17 in regards to the no parking from uh, 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. and then from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. Monday to Saturday uh, along Main Street and the streets designated. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Councillor Funk. Go ahead, Councillor Spikester. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is something we looked at uh, some time ago, and of course, the uh, issue here is that we want uh, uh, safety and we also want proper traffic flow. And, uh, so the change in the speed limit is to reflect the reality of, uh, of, of uh, traffic in that area. Uh, what this does is it, uh, it, it reflects the fact that there is significant traffic in that area, particularly between 7 in the morning and 9 in the morning, and then from 3 to 6 p.m. Uh, so that's when we have the most traffic. And so by putting up those no parking signs uh, during those for those hours, it means that there will be increased traffic flow because there would be an additional lane where people won't have, where people won't have to go around park cars and such and should helpfully uh, should hopefully help with uh, safety and uh, traffic flow. So I think it makes sense for us to go ahead with this. Anything further? All right, anything further from Council? Councilor Swagster, our Councilor Siemens, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think uh, I don't agree with the uh, motion as it stands. I think when you take a look at the history of this, there is, uh, coming from the east, there's a four-lane highway with, with shoulder parking, and uh, that travels at 80 kilometers an hour down to a, uh, a 60 now in this area, and uh, that recommendation to uh, make it a, eight, a 60 kilometer an hour zone was uh, held about three months after the City of Steinbeck, this council, requested that highways reduce the speed limit to 50 kilometers an hour in that area east of Steinbeck to approximately the half mile mark, and this was the response that we got. Now MIT told us in a, their response to the City of Steinbeck that they would leave it at 80 kilometers an hour that they didn't think of speed reduction was appropriate, but in that area, it's 80 kilometers an hour with shoulder parking on the gravel, on the gravel shoulder and uh, or paved shoulder. And we enter then at the water tower shortly before that, we enter now into a 60 kilometer an hour zone and it's got curbside parking starting uh, as recommended here uh, by city council. And then it goes to Main Street where uh, after Breaker, where it drops to 50 kilometers an hour, and then there is a, a parking lane back to two lanes of, of travel. So now we're asking, when we do this, now we're asking people to stop here in a 60 kilometer an hour zone, park on the curb, and they're going to open the doors into 60 kilometer an hour traffic. If you look at all the roads in Steinbeck, this is uh, currently the second highest concentration of vehicles in Steinbeck uh, with traffic, and this is the only place. 60 kilometer an hour zone where we're going to allow people to stop and get and park their vehicles in the curb lane and reducing it to a single lane of traffic. Escalera is 60 kilometers an hour, it's a single lane of traffic both ways and there is no parking allowed. Mackenzie is 50 kilometers an hour, there's curbside parking and our, our highest concentration of uh, traffic is Brant Road for number 12 highway, there it's 50 and 60 kilometer an hour zones and there's no parking. I believe here that there should be no parking allowed uh, at all here, but I would like to make an amendment to the motion that we uh, gotta give a little bit, but that we restrict, uh, in this case, instead of halfway between the Hespler and uh, Goosen, that we begin this process at Goosen instead. Okay. Thank you. 
There is a, a motion to amend. Is there a seconder for the amendment? The amendment, just to be clear, the amendment would be that uh, instead of having no parking uh, under the designated hours halfway down the block, it would, it would then be uh, limited uh, to be farther up past Goosen Avenue and Willow. I'll, I'll, I'll second it together. Second it. Okay, thank you. Please go ahead uh, as, as the storm is going on here. Well. Yeah. The, uh, I think it's important to uh, re reduce more of the no parking zone. What this area is, there's a lot of uh, older housing here. There's some multifamily housing here. Down the road, this will become more multifamily dwellings, and we need to eliminate the parking now to avoid uh, problems in the future. The one reason I agree that we should leave parking in that area is because of the events that happen at uh, United Church and at uh, Care Barker Park, so it is critical that we do leave some parking in there. But I think it is also important that we uh, continue to enforce or that we start to enforce a no parking policy. Thank you. Would you like to speak further? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. I, I, uh, I concur with some of that. I, I actually uh, think that I would be uh, okay with running it all the way back to the water tower, but the, the problem is that we've got two-lane traffic coming into the city, and then, and then you're going to funnel it all into one lane, and, uh, and, uh, and then there's going to be parking on there yet. I, I, just, I, I just don't think it's right. I think eventually this is going to end up being no parking at all. I, I'm, I don't think we're ready there yet, but I think that... Uh, uh, I can agree with uh, Councillor Siemens' uh, uh, amendment. Okay. Further discussion on the amendment? Councillor Swag, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. I will vote against the amendment. Uh, I think we should be clear in what this motion is intending to do. It's intending to, for certain hours, reduce the amount of parking that's happening along that section in order to help traffic flow. And so the motion is to, from these hours, where there currently is parking, removing that during the peak time. So this motion is not increasing parking and making that avail more available. It's making it less available during the key time when we have the most traffic. This is not uncommon for cities to do this, to have designated areas that during these hours, Winnipeg does it all the time, where during these hours there's no parking along the side, during the other hours it's okay. This, is a rec this recommendation comes to us from our staff, from engineering, where research has been done, and I'm comfortable with their recommendation, so I'll vote against the amendment. Thank you. Further discussion? Councillor Funk? Yes, I'll also vote against the amendment because we have to remember that the, we do have the, 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 the stop parking during the peak times, but we also have to remember that there was a traffic study done on this section, and we found out that even though it was posted to be 50, that most cars were doing between 55 and 60. So if it's already working well at 60, I don't think there's, that we need to impose other restrictions other than the ones we have right here. So for that reason, I'll, I'll support the motion, but not the amendment. Thank you. Further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, anything in closing? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I, I disagree with those comments, simply because this is the only place in Steinbeck that we're going to start to provide these restrictions. That means there's additional enforcement required as well at those times, and certainly we have the staff that, that we can do that. It is odd, though, that, that it's brought up that we are increasing the speed limit there because that is, and I repeat in our, is that speed reduction is recommended recent review of the Main Street speed reduction on the east. And now, and then we were told that the reason that, the, that it was increased was because that is uh, what the general flow of traffic was. So that's very interesting because now, uh, as soon as we pave Old Tom, we might as well raise we're going to be requiring that speed limit to be at 100 kilometers an hour because that's what people are going to be traveling there. That's an odd way to make a decision on, on how fast traffic should flow. But uh, the golf course has complained ongoing about people needing to slow down at the uh, crosswalk, so but there too, then we need to raise, potentially then we should raise the speed regulations there as well. But this is about parking, Mr. Mayor, and I believe that there should be no parking in that stretch, or at least at minimum, so reducing it should be there should be no parking at all. All right. Council, uh, we're voting on the amendment to change uh, the no parking from uh, halfway down the block to at the Goosen uh, intersection. Uh, call for the question. All those in favor of the amendment? Opposed? It's defeated. I'd like to now uh, ask for any more discussion on the motion itself. Councillor Pennick. I'll support the motion. I 
hear Councillor Seaman's uh, concerns. However, when we get reports, uh, I guess to a certain degree, we trust that people with expertise are giving us recommendations. And uh, this has been ongoing for quite some time, so I'm comfortable supporting the recommendations. Having said that, maybe in a year from now or something, we can review to see if it is working out the way we want it to be working out. Thank you. Further discussion? Anything in closing? Uh, just very briefly, that just to remind everyone here that this is not about the speed limit change. That's already happened. This is about uh, the parking, and it's simply reducing parking at certain key times so we can improve traffic flow and safety. So I think it makes sense to go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Council, we have in front of us a motion that looks at not reducing the speed or increasing the speed. That's done by the Highway Traffic Board who makes those decisions. It's not by City Council. Uh, this is about the parking restrictions. So this is making parking more restrictive along that uh, line, uh, along that street. Uh, this increased restriction is only going to be valuable though if there's actually enforcement. And so uh, we know that administration, once the signs are up, will uh, be looking at this carefully because uh, we can have all the rules we want, but if we do not enforce them, they will not be useful. So it will be interesting to see in a year's time how this transpires. Uh, I take, uh, uh, I understand what Councillor Seamus is talking about when it comes to the uh, where does the, should the parking stop and start. It is a, sometimes a difficult decision to decide where that is. Uh, at the same time, we've seen staff look at this uh, fairly closely, and they are reducing an amount of, of parking that's going to be there. So I'm comfortable with the recommendation. Call for the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. All right, we are at uh, seven, just past 7.45. We have some, uh, some special guests here. Uh, welcome here. Thank you uh, for joining us. I understand that Mr. Swatsky, you're going to be making presentation to us. Yes, I am. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Council and Mr. Mayor, for having us today. Uh, it's, it's good timing. It's a great time to be here and uh, with you guys just having gone through some summer study session. It's great to hear you're talking about vision and planning and, and the future of our city. So we're going to add some more information to that. Some of it you may have already heard and some of it you may not. So we're just going to hopefully give you a few more things to ponder and consider at least uh, for some time in the future. All right. Uh, so uh, on behalf of the council, uh, I'm sorry, on our, our board and Brian Gunther, our head professional, I want to thank you for having a long-standing partnership and relationship with the golf course. Uh, this is a partnership that's gone back well over half a century when the course first opened in 1954. Uh, and it goes back even deeper with the relationship in council when former mayor, A.D. Penner, uh, helped, you know, modernize the course as we know it today. So it, it opened up in 1968 with nine holes and we eventually grew to 18 in 83-84. Uh, but since then, you know, that's become a showcase for the community of Steinbeck and for the, the provincial golf scene. So it really is one of the best places to play in the province. With that, we also realize that golf has changed, right? The way the game is played and how it operates is very differently than it used to be. Um, courses have closed, you know, they're being sold to developers, they're becoming into different properties and they're seeking new opportunities to make money. So it, it's a different environment than it was, uh, I'm going to say, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, even 30 years ago. Uh, now, we believe a lot of that is actually due to the overbuilding during the boom in the 1990s and 2000s, when golf was at an all-time uh, high or a pinnacle of its popularity. But even as such, you look at it today, one can play 12 different courses within 30 miles of the city of Steinbach, right? It's a lot of choices. So fortunately, uh, with the changes in golf, we've actually experienced something that is a little bit different than the, the trends would suggest. So our membership is growing, our number of rounds in the last few years is increasing, and we're seeing a resurgence in kind of our youth, uh, our youth games, right? So there's lots of activities and things that we're doing to help spur that on. So it's a good sign and we see a strong future for the course itself. I'm going to give you a little bit more information about kind of what we provide to the city. Um, and I think, first of all, we can just talk about the economics of what the golf course is. The golf course has about 1,500 members, and about 600 of them are active. So they're regular users of the course in terms of either playing rounds, supporting, buying memberships uh, on an active level. So it's a good, healthy membership that we have, and the rest of them would be shareholders who are just financial supporters of the club itself. 
We have a staff of approximately 65 people. It fluctuates obviously throughout the year. Um, and we continually host a lot of tournaments, local events, regional things, and some very high profile ones such as the upcoming Manitoba Games. So these not only contribute financially to the club, but also to the community. So when we look at the economic spin-off of what we kind of deliver, uh, we're really contributing a significant portion to the economy. So by our calculations and just based on our revenues and expenditures, we're nearly $2 million directly contributed to the local economy. Of course, most of that's going to stay right here within the city of Steinbeck. So that doesn't include any of the pull-through revenues or any of the other businesses in terms of buying gas or visitors who come to other restaurants. That's just direct association from the golf course. So a very, very healthy contribution to the city. And we're very proud of that. So on top of that, we also have a health and, and wellness aspect to it. So golf, uh, depending on your perspective, can actually be a very, very good stress reliever or in some cases it may cause a little more to some undue circumstances. But overall, if you, if you walk around to golf, it's going to be over four miles. You're talking eight to 10,000 steps. So a really, really good healthy activity for everyone to enjoy. And it's also great for all ages. It's one of the few activities that people of all ages can, can play. Our youngest member is five years old, and our oldest playing member is 93, right? So it is a game for a lifetime. Um, but with that, we also realize that we need to continue to grow kind of that, that movement, right? So we get involved in lots of activities. Uh, Brian, as an example, will uh, work with the school divisions and, and get lots of other local people coming through. And, and it's been 20 years of history and legacy where we've been developing and cultivating uh, those relationships. In the past 10 years, we get about 1,000 students a year who kind of experience the Steinbach Golf Club. So it's a huge number of, of youth that are coming through the course and getting the opportunity to play a sport. All right, so let, let's just get down to it. So here's the real crux of the matter that we're experiencing right now, and it's all about water management. So in the past few decades, we've experienced significant damage from increased water flow. So we believe, and, and we full, wholeheartedly understand that with property development comes challenges in how you move water around. So we've seen things uh, with increases in water and changes in the topography of the course itself that we've had to respond to, and some of them, unfortunately, haven't been all by choice. So we've had additional challenges. So with the diversions of water from Elmdale Creek, you know, uh, flows along Hespler, Old Tom, we're getting additional changes in damage to terrain, which causes us undue uh, circumstances, and unfortunately, loss in revenue. So um, I'm going to tell you a little story here. I started golfing in Steinbeck in 1984. Um, and when I played in those days, I was not very good, so I shot a lot of balls everywhere. And we'd frequently find them in creeks, and, and in those days they weren't really creeks, they were creek beds. Like number six, you just walked in and pulled your ball out and then threw it on the other side and kept going. Well today, there's water standing in places that it's never stood before. Uh, aside number two, green, there's actually a lake where there's no intended pond or diversion, it's just standing water that's consistently there. So we know we're getting an increase in, in water. Uh, Larry Robinson used to pay some of the youth 25 cents a ball to go fish balls out of the pond. And it was a great way as a 13-year-old kid to go make some money. The only thing he had to do with was swimmer's itch. But the only place he could ever do that on the front nine was on the green beside what is now six tee box and, and seven, uh, seven green. Um, there really was no other standing water on the front nine. If you look at how the course sits today, some of it has been intentionally re-diverted and stuff and done, but there is water in so many places that never existed. If only I had those opportunities when I was younger, it would be a good thing. Um, so uh, let's just get back to now. To make this clear, we, we have no issue with water flowing through the course. In fact, we welcome it. We don't need it. We have our own artesian well sources, but we have no problem with water coming through. It just needs to be controlled and it needs to be managed. So on two previous, I'm not sure if council is aware of this, but on two previous occasions, uh, the golf club has made presentations to council. And the first one goes back to 2002, and then there was a second one in 2007. So in 2002, they did an assessment in terms of the damage over the previous three years, um, and it came out to about $290,000. It's just, just a hair under. Uh, and, and since then, there's obviously been a lot of other things that have changed at the course. So we'll leave you a package behind which is going to have some summaries and some breakdowns of some of the financial investments that the course has made. But we'll talk about some of that in just a second. But if we go back at some of the legacy that the golf course has spent on repairing the water damage, 
you're going to see that there's going to be a balance of about, or a total of about $145,000, okay? So, just to make sure that we all understand that, that what this is, that, that's values in terms of things that we've had to spend as a club to make sure that we can manage water in a controllable fashion. So that doesn't include normal spring cleanup, doesn't include the overlying flooding or the debris and sediment. Those are things that we would normally do, so we've excluded some of that information. Now, this is a significant thing for us as a club because we actually run on, on a member-based financial uh, support, right? So we, anytime there's a lot of undue expenditures, we have to kind of compensate, and it makes things difficult, which puts pressures on your membership. So we also understand that even as you see tonight, there's a, a storm, right? It's a rapid storm. There's these onsets of, of weather and climactic change that has happened. So we're not talking about these types of incidents. What we're talking about is the water that remains on the course due to the saturation of it, which is normally would have been in, in I'm going to say decades past or years past, allowed to flow through the course at a manageable rate. So we're talking about the damage that comes to the course in the playability in subsequent days where either we have to be closed because there's too much standing water or there's too much damage to uh, the trails, the paths, debris, overflowing, those types of situations. So when you see this package, you'll see a little bit of math there. And we, we kind of looked at an average over the last number of years, and typically we're closed about five subsequent days per year. Okay? So that alone uh, adds up to a significant loss of revenue for the course. So if we take just our averages and we've done a comparison to what the study was submitted in 2002 and we've looked at it from both ways, obviously adding a base rate with an annual inflation rate and looking at a top down to see if we're in a similar comparison and we're very, very close. And what you'll find is that every year on average as current rates, it costs the club about $48,000 in loss of revenue and damage. for over and above normal conditions. So it adds up to quite a bit. When you add all this total up, uh, you're going to find that it's over half a million dollars, $531,000, just a hair over. Um, so it, it's a huge amount. If you add that on top of the 145, we're getting just over $675,000 in terms of damage expenses, loss of revenue, things that are, would be controllable in, in previous scenarios. Now, we understand that there's conditions like you just saw in Falcon Lake that are just natural, okay? We're not talking about those scenarios. We're talking about scenarios where we could be open if the course was allowed to drain properly and we can't, where our neighboring courses are in fact open. So we know that we're losing revenue and customers to competing courses, but we can't handle them. So, all right. Now, with that, we also realize that we want to be a good corporate citizen, okay? And we have been. We've been really good. Uh, in the past, we've helped develop uh, infrastructure, and we've paved, helped pave for Park Road, about $40,000 worth. We replaced the cover, uh, a culvert on Gulf Road, and we've done some other beautification properties or projects around the property. Uh, and we realized that, you know, the pool is right beside us. It's a great resource. The park is right adjacent. It's a great location, and we're very, very fortunate to have it, to be part of the city. But we need to continue to keep it that way. So we're looking forward to having more discussions about opportunities that are going to involve. And one day, we expect that we're going to be fully engulfed by residences, right? So there's going to be a need to connect those residences back to A.D. Penner. And with that, there could be opportunities for pathways and other associations that we really look forward to having. All right. So here's the, the real heart of what we want to ask for, the, the request. So... First of all, we want to thank you in recognizing that health and well-being are significantly important to the residents of Steinbach. The establishment of a recreation and cultural fund uh, for future activities is, is great. We are thrilled to see those kind of things being recognized. With such, we want your help, and we're going to ask for a few things. So, number one, we would really like an active partnership on water management through the golf course. We want the water to be a manageable lever. We have no problem with receiving it, but it's got to be controlled and beneficial for our property. Number two, we would like compensation for expenses incurred, right? So we'll give you the breakdown, but the value of that, I said, was about $675,000. We feel that these are unfair uh, and unjust for the course to kind of manage on its own, and we look for support. Uh, number three, uh, assuming that work will be done, 
this will be probably a mute point, but we would like uh, agreement to provide future funding uh, at an agreed weight, rate uh, for repairs of ongoing and future damage, right? If the water isn't diverted, we're going to have additional funds and costs and expenses. So you'll see that's currently valued at about 48000 uh, in 2016 dollars. Four, uh, we would like to establish a recreational grant or receive a recreational grant and be willing to work with you in whatever form that is uh, for improvements and betterments at a value of $50,000 a year. Of course, we're very open to discussion and willing to hear what uh, suggestions and recommendations you would have. So, uh, now, I'm going to say one last closing uh, area here, and it's really about the precedent and the reference. So, we understand that you guys have lots of difficult decisions to make. In fact, you are doing some of them today. We also realize that support for community-based functions uh, or community-centric organizations is not new. Right? We're similar to other organizations who have received funding and support uh, in many various forms, the Curling Club, the Arts Council, even minor hockey, uh, and the museum. Right? There's lots of them who are focused on providing opportunities of recreation and culture to their members. Right? So we're just looking for some assistance in those, in those similar precedents. Now, uh, another reference that we kind of have been looking at is kind of seeing what other communities are doing with golf clubs and how they react with their relationship. So one that we've recently found is probably a really good comparison because it's very close. Uh, similar population is, is the city of Winkler. So they've recently changed some of how they support their golf club uh, and they do not pay property taxes or a lease for their property and they've been granted uh, $50,000 a year for five years, so a quarter million dollars. So annually, we're making some assumptions on their tax rate, but they're, they're benefiting anywhere between eighty and, and maybe $100,000 on the high end in terms of, of what their total value received is, depending, of course, what their tax structure is. But we, we believe, we really believe that we offer a great service. It is second to none in the province. And with your support, we'll be able to kind of involve way more functions, uh, get more economic investment, improve culture and well-being, and we'll be able to have a beautiful green space for everyone to enjoy. So uh, at, at this point, we'd just like to say, again, thank you so much for letting us come and speak to you and uh, giving us the opportunity to explain our situation and position. All right. Any questions? Thank you. Yes, we may have a few questions. Uh, you will provide us with a, uh, yes. a written uh, written report have, yes. or a written request. Or? We, we can yeah, you can, you can give it to our to our staff and and we'll use that. But thank you. I'll open it up to questions. Uh, are there any questions council has for for uh, Mr. Swatsky? Councilor Penner. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Swatsky, John, uh, you had talked about. Um, partnership in the water management aspect. What do you mean by partnership? What does that mean to you? Well, we realize that the water, the developments within the city and surrounding the city of Steinbach have, have really changed how water is flowing, right? And, and it's all coming towards the golf course. So uh, I think a partnership, first of all, begins with open dialogue, right? Um, how we approach that, because obviously the city has certain physical boundaries, but it has uh, neighboring municipalities as well. So. I think we would really rely on the suggestion and uh, recommendations of, of the city itself to develop what the terms of that partnership would be. Um, what we really want, though, is, is the ability to manage the flow of water. Because ideally, if, if the city decided to divert all of that water around the golf course, we'd be fine. Right? It, it's, it's just we have abilities to manage it, to, to uh, irrigate the golf course, to manage the flow, keep water in the retention ponds. So we just need outside assistance because we can't afford to actually develop all that infrastructure within the golf course itself to handle the, the surplus of water that we're receiving. Thank you. Yeah. Further questions? Uh, Councillor uh, Fair, please. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, through you. Uh, uh, we, I guess uh, just for information's sake, we know that the, uh, the water running through the golf course is a provincial drain. Is, is there any uh, possibilities of maybe asking the province to, uh, to kick on some of it? Because some of that water problem that's coming in there is really their responsibility. So is that something that you've explored as well? Or? We, we've had, yeah, we've had several discussions, uh, both internally and with some outside uh, organizations. But I, I think there we would really be able, again, this comes back to the partnership thing. Um, there's always strength in numbers. So if we were able to kind of approach this as a joint uh, organizational uh, 
procedure, that would be so much better and stronger. We'd have a much better case. What, what we don't have um, is, the, is the full understanding of how much water is being redirected from either the city and its developments and obviously all the surrounding areas, right? So anytime we get into uh, provincial things that if we could have a city support, that would make it much, much stronger, right? But we would definitely be open to that. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, I have one, one for the question. Do you, um, you indicated that, uh, that, that you lose about $48,000 a year due to lost revenues because you've got closure. Yep. Um, how, how has that changed over the last, say, 20 years? Do you, do you have records to, to indicate how that's changed from 20 we, years? We have records that go back to about um, 2000. Um, in the financial side of things. So if you look there, um, there was about $23,500. So, yeah. So, uh, you know, that obviously is a, a lower rate, but if you would add inflation in, it would be very, of 3% a year, it'd be very, very similar numbers. Yeah. Um, but prior to that, I don't know that we have a, a good understanding or records that would be able to indicate that. Thank you. Councillor Spaxter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I jotted down your four requests, and I just want to make sure that I'm, I, I'm a accurately reciting it. Um, if I can get clarification, like the first three seem to be directly connected to the water issue. Yes. Like active partnership, compensations for expenses incurred, and then agreement to provide future funding if there's future damage, and you gave number 48,000. Uh, your fourth request, receive a recreational grant of 50,000 per year. Is that connected to the water, or is that No, separate? De definite, separate. Yeah, um, and I think the intent there is obviously, you know, when you look at the history of the golf course getting before council, it's every number of years. Um, we also realize that you guys are heavily involved in planning for future activities for the city of Steinbeck. We just wanted to kind of bend your ear a bit and see if there's any additional support with the, the value and what we bring to the city as well in terms of our, our services and cultural impact. Thank you. Further questions? Just a question uh, for clarification to the administration before you leave the podium. Uh, right now, the administration, re, uh, I'm going to use the term the net zero outflow for any new subdivisions that are created uh, for water. So that means whatever was flowing out of a subdivision before it was created, uh, there's a net zero that is presently occurring. Is that correct? In any yes. new subdivisions? Correct. That, yeah. uh, as dictated by the province. And how long have we been applying this to subdivisions? As long as the province, uh, certainly as long as the province has had that regulation or requirement. Uh, is that I'm not ten sure when that would have started. It's about 10 years, is that correct? Uh, I, would, I would suggest longer, but uh, certainly as long as uh, the province has had the regulation. Uh, but uh, my understanding is that has been in place for many years. Question to that? Well, uh, Would you care for a that, comment? <laughs> sure. If, if you have some comments on that, sure. Uh, no, no. Uh, I, I think there's probably two things to talk about in terms of the net zero thing. One is obviously um, studies are, are are good, and you know you can measure them. And I work in the building industry where there's always studies and loading of all kinds of things: water, wind, rain, structural. All the calculating in the world doesn't always dictate what water will do. It will do what it wants to do. It does some very interesting things. Um, so you can calculate and prepare, but there are times where it will just kind of revolve, or sort of evolve and change and do what it wants to do. Um, so regardless of what the studies say or don't say, we can tell you without a doubt that we are definitely receiving more water than we've ever received before. Um, if you look at even the residents, you've heard this before, down Lowen Boulevard, the corner of Old Tom, there's been issues with water management in their properties. Uh, if you go even down probably some of the properties down the back of the golf course, there's water that's being sitting there, should be drained. Um, it's just piling in places where it didn't used to pile. So it has to come from somewhere, right? So. Good, good point. And, and I think when it comes to the, uh, the drain, the diversion of the Elmdale drain from downtown Steinbeck to, uh, to the leg of, of the creek uh, uh, that does flow through the uh, golf course, that would be outside the scope of the net zero because it's, it's really a diversion. And so, so that's an important uh, point to make. Uh, the other question I have is uh, much of the water that does flow through the creek uh, is not necessarily originating in Steinbach, it's originating in the uh, adjoining municipality. Uh, 
has there been any thought of talking to them about it? Or, or uh, I know we have our discussions about that too for, for various reasons. But yeah, have, I, have, have, has the board has definitely discussed it um, because we also realize that you know prior to the annexation of certain amounts of land, there's development that occurred and, and it's kind of flowed through. Um, but there too, I think it's 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 best that we kind of partner with the city to kind of develop an approach to. Uh, go towards neighboring municipalities and figure out a strategy that works best for everybody. So there is a recognition that much of this water actually is not originating in Steinbeck? I would say some. Uh, how much, I don't know, but you know, I'm sure there's studies to be able to quantify the number of, of development in terms of physical uh, building size, pavement, you know, driveways, roadways. All of that water has to go somewhere, right? And, and we all know that individual landowners are not letting it sit on their property, right? They're all grading it to be drained away, whether it's properly done or improperly. So we know that it's migrating instead of sitting on the field, the open fields, which it used to be. So. I think we can recognize that there's a challenge. Uh, water doesn't know those boundaries necessarily, and it, it doesn't make it easier to deal with the at the same time, uh, it does require partnerships to deal with those. And so we, we recognize that with the Conservation District. I know there's been some discussions uh, as well with the, the golf course in regards to some mitigation that can happen through the Conservation District. Uh, and, uh, but, but yeah, certainly it, 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 those boundaries don't, water doesn't know those boundaries. Uh, you know, and I think there too, you know, we're, we're taxpayers of, of towards the city, right? That's where our property lies. So we would definitely, again, look for assistance and partnership with you yeah. to work. Uh, further comments, Councilor Spector. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I don't know if, sure if the question is best directed to Mr. Swatsky or perhaps our, our council representative on the, but just on the topic of the conservation district, like we, I know that there had been, you know, that, that you guys said there had been active discussions about partnership and addressing some of this, and what I understand that is not happening now. And what is the reason that the maybe Councilor Fair is in the best position to answer on that? Because that would seem that, to be that a lot why, of money. That's why I have my hand up. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Councilor uh, Fair. Yes, Mr. Mayor, we, we have had some uh, discussion. As a matter of fact, we've had uh, MIT out there, which is why I brought that up as well. MIT was out there. As a matter of fact, MIT did do a little bit of work on the golf course in clearing, I believe it's number four, uh, the, the reeds that are number four, which has made some difference. I, I think the, the thing that uh, the Conservation District is trying to come to grips with is what is the best solution to it and what's the best bang for your buck. The best, the best solution would be if we could somehow uh, retain some of the water upstream instead of maintaining it on the golf course. And so uh, we've had some discussions, we've been looking for partnerships and uh, right now it just uh, uh, I think talks have stalled a little bit, and uh, we do need to, uh, uh, you know, uh, revisit that again. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how uh, how that's going to be resolved, but they are. We are still working on that. Um, we're just, um, I guess, we're trying to come to grips with what is the best solution, whether it is uh, retention on the golf course, or whether it's retention upstream. And if we go upstream. Then, then there's a, then then we've got a uh, land issue. Where do we tap into? Where can we retain that water? So, and so that's what we're coming to grips with, uh, trying to come to grips with. So, and hopefully that'll solve some of the problem. We want to try to mitigate that in such a way that uh, you know the water to the golf course is is, uh, is much diminished. But yeah, trying to solve it. Thank you. Anything further to add? No. Just thank you for your time. Thank you, Bo. First of all, we want to say thank you for your efforts and all of your efforts uh, when it comes to what you do for the community. Uh, the golf course is an important part of what goes on in our community. It's an impor important connecting point. It's important for people's health, and uh, we appreciate what you do. What we do uh, know is that water retention is a challenge, or water management is a challenge. So we recognize that by joining the Conservation District, uh, and because we know that our neighbors uh, affect us as much as we do. And that means that we need to find those partnerships. And so what you're talking about, uh, certainly uh, I, I can appreciate and understand. And I think uh, we will have a further discussion as a council uh, uh, as we move forward. Uh, just to be clear, uh, we will take your, your requests and, uh, and deal with them uh, in the coming months. Uh, we do have a budgetary process that obviously this goes through. Uh, and that, uh, that culminates in November. So just to be clear on the timeline. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right, Council, we have the uh, accounts payable in the back of the book. Can I have a motion to approve the accounts payable, please? So moved. Thank you, Councillor Penner. Second by Councillor Funk. Any discussion? Let's get back to you. Call for the question. All those in favor? Carried. Any, qu any, councils, or any questions of Council? Seeing none, we'll move to the correspondence and petitions from the Conservation District. Ma'am, March, uh, or sorry, uh, page 18. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll take that as information. We have 11B, the Canadian Union of Postal Workers uh, has sent us a letter on page 23, or 26. Councillor Spikes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's, uh, it's an odd letter because it's talking about uh, the importance of restoring home mail delivery and such. And uh, this is the problem with form letters that go out to all municipalities. Uh, I don't believe we've ever had home mail delivery in Steinbeck, and yet we seem to, uh, to function just fine with our mailboxes and also our downtown locations. So this is certainly one to take his information. They can find someone else to advocate for their demands. Thank you. Any further discussion? It is information. We'll move to other business, and that is uh, Councillor Penner. Uh, in regards to mental health, uh, the amendment to the Mental Health Amendment Act. Uh, yes. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, I want to um, uh, just inform Council about a recent amendment that was made to the Mental Health Act of Manitoba. Um, our Minister of Health, Kelvin Gertsen, and our representative for Steinbach in the Manitoba Legislative Assembly uh, has worked on our behalf on this issue. The RCMP Advisory Group, a few years ago, in conversation with um, our staff sergeant in Steinbach, realized that there's an enormous amount of time that police officers are using to escort people to the hospital for assessment that are in a mental health crisis. Um, it was considered to be uh, um, not only a waste of police resources, but also not in the be best interests of the patient. So, or the person that was coming in for the assessment, officers would often wait hours uh, in order for the person to be assessed and either transferred or admitted, whatever would happen. So recognizing this, um, I, I think, quite misuse of police resources and, uh, and acknowledging that, uh, Calvin Gertsen has, has um, helped us by passing this amendment in the legislature to the Mental Health Act that allows someone other than a police officer to remain with a person waiting to be assessed at the hospital. So the uh, jurisdiction of the RCMP will end once they are transferred to someone else who is deemed capable of looking after the person to be assessed. This is very good news for uh, good use of our, and better use of our police resources, and also good news for mental health um, care in our community. So I want to uh, say a very big thank you to Calvin Gertsen and uh, for his work on our behalf and on behalf of our community. Good. Thank you. All right. We will, we, next is a motion to adjourn, please. Can I have a mover, please? Councillor Fair, second by Councillor Siemens. Any discussion? Call for the question. All those in favour? Carried. Thank you.